السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Now I'll talk about how are you today You know I'm new to Kenya and if you are a civilized like you usually talk to people that they are new to you I always ask people how are you You know the most common answer I get in Kenya Simbaya What does that mean? It's from a point of disparate. I always tell them, please don't say that, or I will stop using the word, how are you? Thank God I have not stopped yet, since 2019, so I think they have changed somehow. Today we want to talk about how to make safe environment to our community that we ask, how are you? And when we are saying, how are you? We don't mean, how are you physically? We don't mean, how is your education? We mean, how are you mentally? I'll give you a quick statistics for you to disregard all the denials we have in our community. But first, there are different ways of listening people. Some they usually listen to you so that you finish. Others listen so that they respond to you. And others they listen to you so that they understand. I want to be heard today and understood. The statistics that I found in Kenya is, can you imagine one in every ten individuals who live in Kenya complaints about mental related illnesses. How many of you knew that? I believe none. Okay. I've looked into the universal health coverage that government of Kenya is spent on health and that is the universal health coverage is like 64 billion Kenya shilling. In most uh, developing countries they usually spend 0.5% of their health coverage to system of mental health. Now let's make a quick calculation. The Kenyan population is 54.9 54 million and the money that you're supposed to spend on health coverage is 64 billion Kenyan shillings a year. What's the, what does that mean? If, if we divide that numbers, it means 5.8 shillings would be spent on health in Kenya. That's 6 shillings. Let's just round on it. 6 shillings of Kenyan budget goes to your health, specifically the mental health. And that is a year. Assume you need mental health, you have mental health problems or you need to see a doctor. That doctor usually charges you like 2,000 Kenyan shilling. It's not US dollars, that's too expensive. If you spend 2,000 Kenyan shilling, that is equal to 28 years of your health expenses that your government have allocated for you. That's a big number, by the way. So if you spend 2,000 Kenya shilling on your mental health at one point, that means 28 years of your life is gone, and the government has no money for you after that. Now let's continue going to that calculation. The average life expectancy of a Kenyan is 68 years old. The average life expectancy. If you go to a doctor at the age of 38, and you are complaining about mental health, and he treats you, only seeing him and talking to him, will cost you the rest of your life is money or health. It's expensive and it is one in ten, so it's common. Do we know that information? I don't think we do. Now, mental health is usually addressed on May and the address is like, there are four parameters that we need to fight with mental health. Number one, we need to fight with the stigma. Number two, we need to educate the community. Number three, we need to also address the sick and treat them. And number four, we are focused policy so that mental health is something that people are actually aware of. Now let's start with point one on the stigma. There is, you say, that where usually I like to refer, think globally and act locally. There is a stigma overall everywhere in the world and there is a historical aspect of it. You know, if someone back in the ages, had mental illness, there were two possible reasons. If a human don't know something, they usually allocate it with something that they think, a hypothesis. So they say, if someone is mentally ill, there's only two possibilities that they are ill. Number one, they are possessed by demons. Number two, God is punishing them. Who would be happy to say that he has mental illness? No one. And that is the historical aspect of it. So what do they used to do? 
There are so many stories out there of which include like some patients who are having mental illness were taken into a hospital, not a hospital, were taken into a place. They were actually like the skull was open so that the demons which were enclosed within the skull comes out. Imagine, and with the anesthesia, by the way, you don't get the lecture of anesthesia of opening up. So that is the background of it. Now in our community, there is a local problem as well. We believe that Muslims don't get mental illnesses. How many of you know someone who has diabetes? Most of you. How many of you think that diabetes is secondary to poor relationship with God? Is it poor relationship with God that you get diabetes? It is just like mental illness. You can be sick in your brain, you can be sick in your heart, you can be sick in your urinary system. Illness, we are human so that we get illness. If that notion of Muslims don't get medical illnesses or like, let us say, mental health illness, it would not be so difficult for people to accept Islamic religion, by the way, because as we are immune to, let us say, we are immune to mental illnesses. Is it so difficult for others to accept the religion of Islam because we say we are immune to mental illness because we are Muslims? Everyone would have followed us. So we are lucky we have chosen this belief and we are lucky we are human for the problems of the world. We are Muslims, yes, but there are problems that are made for humans. You need to carry that problems. Why are we fighting with the stigma? If we don't fight with it, it will cause us problems. There is something called blame victim theology. Someone is sick in their mind. You can, by the way, you can be a good practicing Muslim, tender in their heart, but trouble in their mind. That is common. You can have it. So if you see an issue like that, we blame the victim. Have you prayed Salah? Have you already sworn to Yasin? Yes, I do. But I'm still sick, you see. And then, you know, like, those mental illnesses include depression, which is the number one cause of mental illnesses in Kenya, by the way. And depression, to the far end, it can even make person attempt suicide or commit suicide. Interestingly enough, everybody who have committed suicide, secondary to depression, have notified someone. It's up to you whether you respond to that with shame and fight with them, or you actually appreciate it show some affection on it, and act about it accordingly. So, let us take some concepts in Islam. Nabiullah Yaqub, you know, when he lost his son, Yusuf, what has happened to him? What does that mean? He actually lost sight because of grief. Now there's a question which is neuroscientifically proven. Can you have physical symptoms with emotional problems? Yes, you can. Can you also have physical problems with an emotional symptom? Yes, you can. So, our brain doesn't know the fact that the problem that you have is imminent, or past, or will be in the future. You will suffer exactly the same way as if the pain is now. And what do we call about worry, by the way? It is you are actually captive of your past, you are worrying about your imagination, and you forgot to live today and now. So like, there is no future which will come as future, it will come as today. So we don't want to have that blame victim theology. Patients are sick, we need to treat them. And I believe the Holy Quran is a brave book read by cowardly Muslims. Because it addresses these mental issues as something which is fact, that needs to be addressed, but when we hear, we say about it. We don't want that to happen. What can happen if we don't address it properly? Someone is suffering. They have to get solution for themselves. What happens first is they think they need to cope with it. Coping mechanism is different. It depends on how educated you are and how well you know how to deal with your emotions. But the most common ones that we usually see is, number one, they get addicted with drugs. Drugs. They are getting addicted to it. What does that mean? Someone who is having mental issue now got addicted to drugs. Will you be solving the drug or the mental issue or both at the same time? You will actually add your problems. And do we say drugs actually help? Yes, they do. I'm not advocating 
But I'm saying they do. They say, "Oh, like on the chamber and the maizri, all of them are very big and very beneficial to people. And all of them are more than beneficial." So there is advantage to having these drugs. Marijuana is one of them. Sometimes we prescribe patients that we operate for medications that will keep them ecstasy and feel. Like take the emotional pain and the and the physical pain both at once. So, but that problem is that you are solving with that coping mechanism of taking drugs is, is not permanent. It is temporary. You will leave them daily, 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 and then I don't know how far you can go. You'll go to hell. <laughs> so that's one step of coping mechanism. What can also happen is patients can get. Anger and resentful. So, someone who needs help, they are not able to talk about their illness. They'll get frustrated. They'll be angry all the time, and they'll be resentful. They'll be toxic to their environment. So, we like for your society to be better. Your mental health should be better. And us, like we need to have listening mechanism where we address the issues as they are, and we don't just blame the victim. Let us ask ourselves why Muslims can have depression. Like a good Muslim, to be a good Muslim means you rejoice the good choices you have made, and you feel sad about the bad choices you have made. Sadness is if it is progressive to uncontrollably, it's mental illness. So you can't say I'm Muslim and I can't get mental health. Actually, being a good Muslim and doing something bad will make you feel worse. So, like, I'm not only telling you problems now. I'm telling you also solutions. This mental health issue is something that's within us. We deal it on a daily basis. The environment is actually exacerbating it. We cannot talk about it, and patients they will actually die in silence because you haven't given them a space of talking. And then the worst thing that you can keep someone shut in their mouth is by telling them religiously you shouldn't have had this problem. So. You have made him feel guilty by not becoming a good Muslim. But if you have taken that barrier away, they would have come to us or to doctors who can deal with it, and then they would have been addressed easily. Then patients could get cured. They will continue their life. What can we do about it? Number one, I can't tell you life is easy. It is not. If you want to play an easy card, that easy card is not in the game of life. So you are wrong if you want to play that. It's difficult. But you have a moral obligation. You have moral obligation to actually carry the biggest heavy load you can carry, and you do it voluntarily. I will not carry your loads for you. You do it voluntarily. How do you do it? Simply going back to teachings of Islam. You make schedule. You can't tell me you can live in this society and you don't have plans on your own life. You should have yours. If you don't have, you'll actually be the environment that we. I would say people who have plans will play with. So make your own plans, and by plans I mean do the thing is okay. Usually this uh, mental illness is start from fear of something that you don't know. Usually we tend to destroy what we don't know, or afford if we cannot destroy. So the thing is that you afford most of your time is where your weaknesses lie. You approach it, do it diligently and daily, and. I can't tell you you will reach a point where you say I'm done all that I could do. No, as long as you are in the game of life, your life is continuing and your challenges need to be addressed daily. There are problems that you need to day that you need to solve daily, and who anybody who tells you otherwise, I can tell they are lying. So I believe, like the environment of universities, I've been a teacher and a student at the same time, so I understand. What we have in our higher education system, nobody cares how you do it, but I want you to do what you're supposed to do. That's it. If you are doing less than better than the others, you actually have me torturing you. Your your friend who is better than you in some aspect of it, telling you ah you are amount to nothing. So these kind of problems will actually build up. You'll feel anger, and do you know what they say about anger? They say it's like drinking a deadly poison and expecting the other person to die. They will not die. It's you who's dying. So your problems need your solutions. And I believe, as much as we don't know our weaknesses, we also don't know our strengths. 
Why don't you figure it out? Do the best you can. You decide it how best you can do it. Nobody will decide for you because it's your own game, own battle, own war. Everybody's fighting his own war in their own ways. Find out, fight with it, and then come up with something. You're always improving on a daily basis. There is no standard where we say, yes, you are a good person, you are a bad person. No standard. The standard is you who is setting it. When it comes to mental health. And then one more factor that's actually destroying our society is the social media now. Like, how many of you is in medical school? Okay, these are, okay, somehow they are lucky. In other terms, they are actually not lucky. They are the people who have the maximum delayed gratification on their effort. You go to school for 12 years, nothing happens. You go to university, nothing happens. You see us still continuing studying, nothing has happened. So you don't know your goal and how you would reach. So what happens is they will be easily addicted. They can be addicted to social media, they can be addicted to drugs, they can be addicted to anything. So what do you need in this environment? Because us as a healthcare providers, we have bigger challenges as well. And then most of your time you will be dealing with patients who are very sick. You will be having these traumas daily basis. So you need to have a coping mechanism. And when you are in need of help, ask one. There is no reason you need to shut it out. Okay, how would I do it better? I would say, figure out something that you daily do which is remarkably making your life worse. Act about it and then finish that. Do it daily. That goal will even make you f like feel there is no mental health issues at all because you are daily pursuing your own goals. And then, all the time, you are actually sacrificing the present for the future. The goal is whatever you are doing should be worth of something in the future so it warrants the suffering you are going through. I'm not saying life is easy, I'm saying it's difficult, but it is worth taking it. Okay, now like, let's take a simple example of things that I have noticed here in this, com in this group. You know, this time, we are in HR, it's not easy. It's not actually easy, but we take it for granted. Those who are we are in HR, we don't appreciate them. We don't say, you are doing a great job. We think like they are doing what they are supposed to do. Let them do it. No. At least appreciate what they are doing. Continue. Show them affection, appreciation and attention. And then life will continue in a better way. And this message should always reach to the community. Because it is the community who you will address your problems with. They should know that you can have mental illness. They should know that it needs to be addressed. They should know that you can treated psychologically, socially, and through medication, and then you should act accordingly. Now, like, this lecture is generally about common mental health. I'm not into treating individuals, but if someone is affected, we need to treat them. Like, someone may say, where is the role in religion about treating mental health issues? There is a role, by the way. When we are treating mental health issues, we usually say, use bio, psycho, social. Biological are drugs, psychologically is telling the belief is like you use the root of the belief of that individual and then tell them in their own language and then they will look find and they will find facts from within their belief is. So there is an aspect of psychological treatment with Islamic religion. You do it and I'm actually grateful like this effort this should happen quite often. I feel learning a lot today. So Sessions like this would actually help you. So if you increase more than more of this, I believe you will be actually increasing psychologically. The last part of actually addressing mental health issues is to advocate health policies that will ensure the mental health of an individual. That is for the government officials. It's not for you. But I'll tell you today, number one, mental health is a disease just like diabetes mellitus. You don't tell someone, go pray because you have diabetes. You don't tell them, go read your to your seen. You tell them, okay, go and see doctor. It's, it needs the same attention. Number two, the community needs to be educated so that they address this problem as if it's a real problem. Because I'm saying one in ten. That means if you go out of this hotel now, 
If you see 10 individuals, one of them is having actually mental illness. I don't mean it should be obvious that everybody notices it, but it is there and it needs an attention. So with that, thank you so much for having me today. I'll conclude my topic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.